It's a real pleasure to have JP back, JP Onella. And Yuka Pekka, uh, well, we know him for many years. How many years has it been? I think it's been over 10 years. Over 10 years. Yes. Oh my goodness, I don't know what it So I got to know JP when he was a student back in Finland. And, uh, and he came to my lab and spent quite a bit of time there collaborating in a really cool paper in the early ages of mobile phones of uh, trying to use mobile phone data to understand uh, uh, kind of social networks. And uh, so after, after he got his PhD, uh, uh, I may skip a couple of steps. You were in Oxford as well, yeah, right? So went yeah, to Oxford, yeah. then he came to Boston, worked with David Lazar, he worked with uh, 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 Nicolas Christakis, so just about everybody who matters in the field, he only skipped <laughs> Alex. <Sack. laughs> right? But he was his opponent at the PhD team. Oh, that's so, right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's part of the family. And then eventually landed as a faculty at Harvard and has been there ever since. And in a way, I guess he did get infected by the mobile phone thing because uh, he developed a, a really cool career on uh, what he will tell us about on digital phenotyping, how to really use uh, kind of mobile phones to understand human diseases. And he kind of smartly developed a platform that he will tell us about that I personally believe will be the winning platform for us to understand diseases. And so much I believe that we are actually investing in developing it further uh, from our food dog project and kind of get new possibilities around. And the reason we wanted to have him here today is not only to reconnect, which is always fantastic, but to learn what he was able to do with this digital phenotyping idea and what the, what the technology that he developed can do. So without further ado. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laszlo, uh, for that introduction. Thank you for, for having me here. I'm just in the process of developing a cold, so, so hopefully you can hear me in the back too, if not just, uh, just wait uh, vigorously. There's, there's room in the front. Yes, exactly. So just as a very brief, and that was, that was a perfect introduction to, uh, to, to my background so far. So I'll just say a couple of more words. So I have a small lab of about not nearly as big as this place. I have maybe six or seven or eight people in my lab, three postdocs, three PhD students, and a couple of uh, master's students. And we do work in, in two different areas. So the first area we call the statistical network science. So we try to bring statistical ideas into more classical network science. And the second uh, piece that we've been working on, which is really outgrow from the work that we did with Laszlo and others in the early days, um, is what we call digital uh, phenotyping. And I felt that I would use this opportunity to shamelessly advertise uh, what we've been doing also, not in the research realm, but, but in the educational realm. So we put together a, a Harvard X course called Using Python for Research. And the idea was that we saw that there were many basic, in, like essentially introductory courses for Python out there, nothing intermediate. I'm sure all of you are already experts in Python, but if not, if, the, if you'd like to learn more Python, if you're a beginning Python user, you may enjoy checking out this, this class. My personal goal was for version one, which just completed a couple of days ago, was to get maybe 500 people to take it, but we actually had over 60,000 people uh, take this course. And so we developed some more materials and we're launching version two in a couple of weeks time. So in case you're interested, it's all, all free, um, of course. So what I plan to do in the next uh, 35 or 40 minutes, which is I think what I've been given, I want to tell first about the, the problem, that, the scientific problem that we're trying to solve at a conceptual level. Then I'll tell you what is the solution that we propose, both conceptually but also in terms of the platform. So we've developed some tools that can hopefully be used to address this problem. And then I'd like to give you a few examples of how we use this in actual uh, biomedical settings. So I just want to set up some basic terminology. Many of you might be completely familiar with this, but I think it's helpful to set up some, some basic concepts. So first of all, what's the phenome? The phenome is the complete phenotypic representation of the species, such as anatomy, enzyme activity, hormone levels, and, and behavior. And behavior is part of uh, our phenotype for sure. The reason we don't talk about that very much is because it's been traditionally so difficult to quantify that. So um, the large-scale investigation, large-scale phenotyping is often called phenomics. I'll be using these terms interchangeably. And over the past 20 years, many investigators have promoted the role for large-scale phenotyping as a, complet, as a complet for genome sequencing, as a way to make progress in bio biology and the biomedical sciences. And, uh, and so today you'll hear about our solution. 
if we think about what does genetic research do, it tries to identify genotypes that are associated with, with human phenotypes. But many would argue that what's currently holding us back is our inability to specify phenotypes precisely. And the point is that there are actually two separate distinct reasons for us to learn about phenotypes. One is to be able to learn to do better phenotyping for the sake of phenotyping per se. And the second point is for us to be able to connect these phenotypes more effectively with genotypes. So this is a dual, it's a dual purpose. So if we think about standard diagnosis, we know that they tend to be incomplete and imprecise. And these are typically done in the setting of, of, of medical practice, but medical practice varies from person to person, from place to place, from country to country. So this is why they tend to be uh, unreliable for, for phenotyping. And many have argued that what we really need is a more comprehensive and high throughput system for phenotyping, and, uh, and, uh, and that's what we'll be uh, talking about. And behavior has traditionally, I already alluded to behavior, behavior has traditionally been uh, uh, identified as an especially challenging phenotype because of two reasons. It's temporal dependence and it's context dependence. And uh, just a few years ago, if people wanted to learn about someone's activity, they would essentially have to add additional instrumentation. So people would be asked to wear GPS devices, maybe wear accelerometers and so on. And this is perfectly fine in maybe for short term duration, for intermediate term duration, and it's perfectly fine in younger people and people who are not sick. But if I think about the cohorts that we have, we started this project with the goal of having one single cohort at MGH. We now have 15 different cohorts, and we have a study going um, at every single HMS Harvard Medical School teaching hospital. So we have patients who have brain tumors, who have cancer, people who are bipolar, they're schizophrenics, and so on. So these are people with serious illness. So you cannot take somebody who has a brain tumor and say, would you happy to carry this uh, two pound device on you for the next six months or nine months so that we can get better data. That's just simply not going to, uh, to happen. And so these are some of the reviews, I guess this doesn't work. Not there. These are some of the basic physics. Huh? So these are some of the reviews that people have been writing about this problem. And this one here is a review that I wrote with Scott Rausch who is the president of the McLean Hospital, which is here uh, nearby. So let me try to give you an example of what do I mean that, by the idea that they claim that phenotypes are not precise. And we have several studies in psychiatry, so I'm going to use one example. I'm going to use psychiatry as an example. So in psychiatry, there's something called DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And this is basically uh, an expert opinion about what, uh, what constitutes bipolar disorder, what constitutes a major depressive disorder, and so on. So what have people, people have been doing for decades is they list uh, a set of symptoms, and the idea is that for you to be diagnosed as having depression, you have to have a bunch of these symptoms from this list and a bunch of symptoms from this list. That's the, that's the basic idea. So for um, a major depressive disorder, we have nine of these symptoms, like depressed mood, change in sleep, fatigue, concentration, and so on, lack of ability to concentrate. And then if you do the combinatorics, if I got these numbers right, you have 256 ways of picking these different symptoms. And they all map to the same, same diagnosis, which is major depressive disorder. So the point here is that this really is more like an umbrella diagnosis, rather than really a very specific or precise disease um, phenotype. And there are two other existing approaches that people are using to try to address the phenotyping challenge. One is electronic medical records. The problem with them is that we know that they're not collected for research purposes. Building codes alone are not very informative. And people have used natural language processing, but it's limited. So for example, in psychiatry, a lot of uh, clinicians don't actually write all the interesting stuff in the medical notes. And that's because they would like to write that, but the patient wouldn't tell them about this interesting stuff if they know that your clinician is going to be typing this all up. So what they do is they keep a separate file, which is often called uh, shadow notes in psychiatry, and the really interesting stuff is in those shadow notes. So one of my collaborators, who is a clinical psychiatrist, he tells me that electronic medical records are great for learning about two things. One is the name, the name of your pets and where you went on your, on your family vacation. So these are two things that they're really great for. But 
natural language processing, even if you do some fancy deep learning stuff, whatever you do, it doesn't help if you don't have the data in those records. So the second approach that many people are now using, and a lot of companies like Apple and, and, uh, and Google are pushing for, is that of using wearables. And if you look at the literature, you can basically divide it into two different categories. There are the engineering studies, where a company asks their own employees to wear these devices, and adherence is incredibly high. But then if you look at the general population, typically you have to have a clinician who is involved all the time, who keeps calling these individuals, you should be wearing your, your watch, and so on. And the numbers are, are not very promising. So about a quarter of people stop wearing these things after six weeks, and 40 to 50% stop wearing them at six months. So this is the, the issue. This is the problem, so what do, we, what do we propose to do? So our solution is obviously digital phenotyping, which is also in the title of this, of this talk. So what we need is we need a scalable way to measure social and behavioral markers objectively in, in the wild. And our idea is that now almost everybody has a smartphone, and they've become so sophisticated that we should be able to use them to essentially solve this measurement problem. And as part of our work in this area, we've defined the concept of digital phenotyping in the following way. To us, it is the moment-by-moment -moment quantification of the individual-level human phenotype in situ, in the wild, using data from personal digital devices, in particular smartphones. And there are a couple of similar-sounding terms. Some people talk about digital phenotypes, but they define them a little bit differently. So this is our definition of, of, this, of this term. And if I think about uh, some of the advantages that we would like to claim that this approach has, I think there are three, three primary advantages. One is, because of the prevalence of this technology, we can have studies that are very large. So we could potentially have a study with 10,000 people or 100,000 people. But the technology is incredibly scalable. The second thing is that we can use passive data. So rather than relying people on doing all kinds of tricks with their phones or, or, or uh, doing too many surveys or asking them to complete different tasks, like holding their phones, the more we can rely on passive data, the longer our studies can be. So now we have studies that have a large N and a large T. And the obvious benefit of this is that now we can go to the population level. So typically, the way our medical system works, and I know we have MDs in the audience, I have to be a little careful here. Typically, we don't know much about what happens to you before you develop PTSD or something like this. And we know a lot afterwards. But so the idea here is that if we have an approach like this, we can also get the pre-data, pre-something, pre-diagnosis data, not just the post-data. And that could be incredibly valuable uh, for, for many uh, reasons. I have to allude to this paper since I'm in this lab. So this is uh, work that we did with Lotso and many other collaborators uh, over 10 years ago now. And, uh, and one of the things we wanted to address was what's called the, the weak ties hypothesis, so everybody knows this. We have two people in a social network, A and B, and they have a tie, and the hypothesis claims the stronger the tie, the higher the fraction of friends these two people have in common on average. And so the challenge was obviously how do we collect these data at scale, how do we quantify tie strength, and so on. So uh, you should read the paper if you haven't, so I'm not going to spoil it for you. But the basic idea is that we were able to get data for, uh, I think, six or seven million individuals. They were connected through maybe 24, 25 million ties. These numbers sound small today, but back in the day, they were, uh, I think, fairly impressive. The main point here is, I don't want to talk about the results. The main point is that this is communication technology that's used to communicate with, with other individuals. But the point here is that use of this technology generates as a byproduct data that we can then use to address and, and answer, in some cases, scientific questions. <coughs> and that's, our, that's uh, the essence of our approach. So we started the, uh, what we call the Digital Pins Project in, in 2013. And I'm eternally grateful for the NIH for, for, for funding this, this crazy idea. So we had two goals or two aims in this, in this project. The first was the development of infrastructure. The second was the development of statistical and computational and mathematical methods. So the first goal was to develop a customizable, scalable, open source research platform for high throughput um, smartphone-based digital phenotyping. Our platform is called Beewee. And Biwi is the name of a Nordic goddess of sunlight and mental health. So that like, seemed like an appropriate name, so that's why we picked that. 
Then the second goal was to develop statistical methods for making sense of the collected data. So we typically collect, collect about one billion data points per subject month. It's a lot of data, it's very high dimensional, it's longitudinal, it's network data, it's spatial data, it's all kinds of data. So it's, it's pretty challenging to deal with, um, with, with that data. So our overall goal in this area is to systematize data collection analysis for smartphone based digital phenotyping. Now our point is, our goal is to make everything that we've developed in the past few years openly available as open source code. Not just the front end, which is the apps, but the back end, the data analysis pipeline, and all of, all of that. And as part of this work, um, and many other people use the same terms, but it's helpful to, to quickly uh, talk them through. So we can divide all the data we collect on these devices into two different groups. So by active data, we, mean, we refer to data that's only generated if the subject actually actively does something. Like they give you an audio sample, they take a survey or something like that. That's in contrast with passive data, which can be of two, type, or two types. It can be either sensor data, like GPS data, or it can be log data from the phone, like, like communication logs, screen on of logs, battery logs, and, and so on. And I mentioned already that we have uh, several studies, probably a few too many ongoing at this, at this point in time. An obvious objection a few years ago was, that, well, nobody really has smartphones. And now we know that uh, this is actually, this statistic is somewhat outdated. Today, something like 82% of US adults have a smartphone. But it's hard to believe that only in, 20, in 2011, the number was at 35%. And, and so I used to ask people, I used to ask audiences, who here has a smartphone? I stopped asking that question like two or three years ago. It's, it's everybody always has, or maybe it's the people that I, I <coughs> know. So, but what's also really important, that if you look at the, uh, this is the percentage of users as a function of time, it's not surprising that we see this trend in the general population. But then how about people who have serious illness? So for example, this is, uh, this is the ownership and use of uh, mobile phones and smartphones of people who have psychosis. And that's the blue line over here. And it's behind the general population level, but the projection is that in a few years' time, they, the two curves will, will coincide. So uh, this is the conceptual problem, and, and then I've told you about the conceptual solution. So let me talk a little bit about the platform that, that we've developed. So the idea is we have two components, two pieces of this platform. We have the front end piece, which has an Android, and so we have an Android and iOS uh, piece, so we support those two uh, phone operating systems. The two of them jointly cover some like 99.5% of all of the world's uh, smartphones. Then we have a back-end system which sits on AWS, Amazon Web Services, so it makes use of cloud computing infrastructure. And the main reason for basing this in the cloud is that first it's economically, it makes sense, it's actually the cheapest way to do this, but it's also incredibly scalable. And we have four pieces to the back-end. So one is our web interface, so we can go in, we can set up a study, and depending on, on how complicated the study is, the setup might take 5 to 15 minutes. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Then we have a data collection piece, so we use easy to instances, like almost everybody else in the world. So the idea is if you have a large study and more and more subjects uh, join your study, then the system will automatically fire up new servers as, as are needed. As your study starts to wind down, then it brings down those servers. So you're always operating at an optimal level of resource use. We store our data there. The data are always encrypted, whether on the device, whether on transit, or when stored on the, uh, on the server. And the most important piece, the piece that I will not be talking about today, is what we've actually been doing, which is the data analysis pipeline. So we've been developing several new techniques for making sense of these data, and we've implemented these, these methods, these techniques in software. And so the idea is that we have this integrated data analysis pipeline. So the idea is if you use B to collect the data, We'll be able to use Beaver to analyze the data. And this is a growing suite of, of, of methods and uh, software. So how does this thing work in practice? So we set up a study, which doesn't take too long. And the second thing is we hand out, which is step two, we hand out our subjects, usernames, and passwords. So if you're a, a person in our study, you go on iTunes and you download the app. You're punching your username and your password, and the system automatically connects you with the right study. So you get the right surveys, you get the right type of passive data collection, and, and so on. 
a huge uh, point, and this, I cannot emphasize this point enough, is that we collect only raw data. So we don't collect those summaries that Google or Apple would give you. We collect raw data from all sensors and, and all logs. And this is hugely important, and I could spend two days talking about this, but I know that this talk is finite. So I'll just take a couple of minutes later to, to, to make that point. So then the data are fed into the data analysis pipeline, which also sits on the cloud, making it scalable. And another point that we've been working on is the idea of how do we make research in this area highly reproducible? So I'll touch on that point also in a second. Yeah, please. Based on the study, the participants are enrolled. Can you do push notification like uh, some interventions during the study? Yeah, so we haven't, at this point, we're doing phenotyping. So, so somebody else can build that. I mean, its interventions are hugely important. But since you asked, I'll give you my philosophy on this. Mm -hmm. So these devices have 10 to 12 different data streams in Google. I think it's feasible to collect all these data streams within the confines of a single platform. I don't think it's feasible to implement all types of interventions from schizophrenia to, to diabetes within a single platform. So the idea is that we see this as, this, the platform does one and only one thing really, which is to collect data and try to make sense of that data. But because it's going to be open architecture, then somebody else can take the code code that we have and build uh, their intervention pieces on top of that. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. So if we think about the data streams, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So we have active data, so we can do simple surveys, which is sometimes also called EMA, Ecological Momentary Assessment, also sometimes called Experience Sampling. We collect the data, but also metadata. So you can imagine if somebody's taking a long time to, to think about their responses, maybe somebody readjusts their responses to a question and so on, so we get all that, all that data. We can also do voice and audio recordings, and we use this in two different ways. So if you have a psychiatric study, we can prompt the person to think about their last day or last week, so then they can basically be talking about whatever they want. They have a minute or two, and, and that's the data we collect. And we might be looking for things like vocal markers of depression in that case. In other studies, we give very specific instructions. So we have a study going on at MGH with an ALS cohort, and, and I had no idea about this before we started the study. It turns out in ALS, the most diagnostic thing is, guess what? You can guess it even by the fact that I'm talking about this now. The most diagnostic thing in ALS is audio. It's not, it's not imaging, it's not any blood test, it's not, it's not cognitive tests, nothing like that. It's audio. Data. So what they do is they bring these ALS patients once a month to the hospital, they go into a quiet room, and they read what's called a butterfly, a caterpillar passage. It's some, some, I forget the exact animal, but it's called something like that. It's called the butterfly passage. It's a few sentences long, and they read it out loud. Of course, it's very hard for them to articulate, especially towards the end. It's a terrible illness. And this audio gets recorded. And this is where these doctors who are treating them know where is this person on the scale? You know, how many months do they have to live? Survival is terrible, of course, in AIDS. So what we're doing in this study is, once a week, we're prompt, prompting them to read the passage on their smartphone. And it turns out, as long as you're using high a bit rate, and high sampling rate, the, the quality of the audio is actually very, very high. On the passive data side, um, we collect things like GPS, taxonometer, gyroscope data, phone screen state, a lot of things. This, this is not a complete list, but basically everything that we can get our hands on. And of course, what's, what's going to happen over time, phone makers will introduce more sensors, and then we'll try to add those um, to the platform. So we can quickly set up a study. The, the backend enables us to manage. Uh, it's very, very basic in this sense. It's not going to win any awards for being beautiful or anything like that. But it's very functional. So we can reset someone's password and, and so on. This is all uh, very straightforward. We can do surveys. And we also have very simple branching logic. So typically, we don't want to ask too many questions. But in some settings, it is important still to ask questions. And that's important because some experiences are purely subjective. Like, you know, for example, how much pain are you in? That's a subjective experience. So although we try to rely almost exclusively on passive data, in some settings we do need to ask uh, some surveys. The idea of having a branching logic behind this is that we can ask the smallest number of questions in, in any situation. 
In the back end, we can customize the data collection settings. So let's think about a situation where we're very interested in a person's mobility. So we go and we click the GPS box over here, and then we go to the right. And this may be too small for you to see, it's just GPS on and GPS off. So the idea is all sensors are sampled in two states, on state and off state. So when it's the on state, you're getting continuous time data from the sensor. When it's in the off state, the sensor is leaving and you're not getting data uh, in that case. So here we have GPS on for 60 seconds and it leaves for 600 seconds. And why do we use this type of sampling? Well, if you know about GPS, you know that it kills the battery, the phone battery, in about an hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on the make of your phone and the state of your, your battery. So, so it has to be sampled, it cannot be on at all times. Well, an obvious solution seems to be, let's have it be on for one second and off for 15 seconds. That doesn't work, because it has to find those satellites, especially if you're in an urban city like you guys are here, you have a smaller spatial angle, it's gonna take more time. So in practice, it turns out that we need about 30 to 60 seconds to find the satellites, and that's when we get the uh, location. This, of course, introduces a huge, massive data, uh, massive data, a missing data problem, because you know you're missing more than 90% of your data. But this is the kind, of, an example of the kind of statistical problem that we've tried to tackle in the past few years, and it turns out that this this problem can be addressed uh, very well. So effectively, it's almost like we're collecting continuous time data, although we're only collecting for one minute, say every 10 minutes like in, in this specific example. But you can always combine GPS with solar meter data, right? Not for location, no. Not for spatial location. We do combine data streams, but to learn about your location, accelerometer wouldn't tell you where the person is. You could combine Wi-Fi data and cell tower data, but the problem is that those, um, so when a phone, and this is a longer, longer topic, but the problem is that if you switch between different ways of measuring something, these different ways of measuring something have massively different variances. And the problem is you have a confounder with location. So it could be that whenever I'm here, my location gets measured using one approach. Wherever I'm there, it's measured with another approach. Not a problem for doing point estimates. It is a problem if you want to do inference with the data. Because then it, it, gets, it gets complicated. So for us, anyway, uh, it was much easier and simpler to uh, solve the missing data problem. I should say from my postdoc, because he really did the, uh, the bulk of the work. So just to show you, I, I know you've all seen stuff like this, but, but maybe this is uh, useful if technology works. All right, let's uh, minus. So this is, uh, this is Huntington Avenue. We're somewhere here right now. And this is Longwood Avenue, and this is the, the medical school. So this is one of my uh, doctoral students. Um, we spike into work, the object's a bus there. You can see the tail, it reflects the length of the, the velocity of the person. There's a bike shed over here. He gets on his bike over there, and then he walks into the building and so on. So this is a great way to track your, your PhD students if you're a, <laughs> <laughs> if you're a faculty. Um, the, the reality is that we, if we could get data like this, we would, but in practice we, we cannot because of the missing data. Issue. So then, um, but again, we essentially, I think, not we don't have a full solution to that, but we've effectively, I think, solved the missing data problem. Then once you have your, your GPS data, your communication logs, and so on, we summarize them using different summary statistics. We collect the raw data, but for all the analyses, you have to summarize this data in some way. So for example, from, from mobility, we infer the location of your home, so then we can estimate the amount of time you spend at home. Very important quantity in all of our studies. We can estimate the distance traveled, we can estimate the number of significant locations you have, and so on. For sociability, we can learn things about like, you know, how long are your text messages you're sending out. We don't get the content because we technically could, but through IRB, we just, that would be a nightmare to try to get that through IRB, but maybe in the future. We can estimate things like, what's the probability for you to return a text message? So I send Alex a text message. What is the probability that he's going to reply to me? Mm -hmm. and we love so. <laughs> Actually, he's great. Yes, this, yes. this man gets back to my emails. <laughs> so we, have, we have about a couple of hundred or something like that, summary statistics. And the point of having um, the point of having the raw data and storing it is that if we don't have the summary that we care about, it can also always be uh, constructed. 
here is a couple of days worth mobility traces for one of my one of my previous RAs. So we take the GPS data, we project it down, and we do what's called uh, essentially we decompose it into what I call flights and pauses. So pauses are exactly what it sounds like. There are times when the person is not moving, and flights are times when the person is moving at a more or less constant velocity in a more or less uh, a single one one direction. So linear movement. So what we do here is, this is data, mobility data for this person for Monday, this location of her home, this location of her work. The size of the circle tells you how long the pause is. So a big circle means long pause. She spends all her time in her home and at work. Then we color code both the pauses and the flights. So dark red is midday, dark blue is midnight. So I, I know you cannot tell from GPS data, she has a dog. So she took her dog on a walk this morning. Then she comes to work, it looks like the M2 to my untrained eye. And then in the middle of the day, she goes out. She's probably, it's, it's very dark. So it's around noon or 1 p.m. So she's going out for coffee or lunch or something like that. These are the trajectories for Monday and Tuesday. This is, by the way, pure GPS data. We, she was carrying an extra battery, so we could collect 24 7 GPS data for one week. Trajectories for Monday and Tuesday, Saturday and Sunday. The point is not to make trivial statements like people behave differently on Saturdays or Sundays. Of course they do. There's no question about that. But now imagine somebody who, have, who has brain tumor or is bipolar or something like that. Maybe before surgery, people don't move around. Maybe they stick to the, the uh, vicinity of their homes. As they start to get better, they might uh, venture out further and so on. Or if you want to think about it, the bipolar example, we have two bipolar studies. Maybe this is where the person is feeling depressed. And maybe this is when they are not depressed or are manic or something like that. So one can come up with all kinds of uh, ideas why it would be helpful to actually quantify these things. So then I'll just want to, I'm not going to go into all the details. I haven't talked about any of the stuff that we actually do, which is building these methods. But I don't want to, I don't, I know it's Friday at 4 p.m. So I don't want to be a technical talk, but I do want to give you a flavor of, of what we try to do. So here is a trajectory. This would be a continuous time trajectory. If we could do this, we would always do this. In practice, we have to sample because of the battery issue. And so we computationally uh, superimpose the sampling schedule on top of this. So you look at the full trajectory, we get these bits and pieces. And then we developed our invitation approach. So this is now we take this data, we've trained our model, if you will, and we fill in the missing bits. Now, crucially, you would like this to look more or less like the real data, but that's actually not even that, that important. Because this data, as, as it is here, doesn't enter your models. It doesn't enter your analytical framework. What does is you take this, this trajectory, you summarize it again using a bunch of features, and you use those summary statistics in your analysis. And long story short, let's say that I'm just going to ignore missing this. So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to see a few points here, I see a, you guys have a marker? Yes, here is one. I'm just going to superimpose this also on this plot. I'm sorry about that. So you have a few GPS points over here. Mm -hmm. You have a few GPS points over here. This is one burst. This is another burst. Mm -hmm. And it's surprising that on a planet with three billion or something like that GPS devices, nobody had really thought about the problem of missing data for GPS. And that's because the standard use case is one where you drive from A to B, it's on for half an hour or 45 minutes, and then it's off for several days. So the only approach that we could find was you have your first burst, you have your second burst, you take, this is so trivial that you're going to think it's crazy, you take the last observation of the first, the first one of the last, and you connect them with a straight line. It seems like this could work, it feels like it should work, and it might work in some cases. So let's see if that works. So we, this is just an example of two summary statistics. I'm going to just look at the bottom row over here. So this is uh, so it's called average flight duration. But, but the most important thing for us is to realize is, is the following. The true value, the truth, which we know in this case, is 77. And if we use our method, which is this GLC-10, which sounds odd, it's 57 and plus minus something, which is our standard error. Our method actually does not contain the truth, so it seems like it's a little bit off. And this is why it needs some more, more tweaking. Now let's say that we do the linear interpolation, which is the method I just showed you. We get 340. 
So the truth is 77. We are off for sure. We are at around 60. You don't do any imitation, you're 340. So your summary statistics will be off by a factor of 400% or 500% if you don't address this imitation problem in some way. Let me say a couple of words about reproducibility, and then I'm going to show a couple of examples. So in physics, we're used to the idea that studies replicate and studies can be reproduced pretty, pretty well. But in medicine, in biomedi the biomedical sciences, this is, this is not the, the case. So there was a study which came out in 2011, and it found that about two-thirds of studies fail a standard test retest approach, and only 6% of studies were completely reproducible. So what that means, about one study, more or less, in 20, completely replicates. And so, so what the, what's the lesson here? For me, the lesson is that we don't need more studies, per se. We need studies that can be replicated. So this is one of the things that we've, we've tried to do in this area. So I thought about this problem, especially when we had our kid, and we used to order a lot of stuff from Amazon. You know how they have this really appealing one-click buy. You click there, and stuff gets delivered to your home, which is a fantastic idea. And I thought about this, why does, why does it have to be so difficult to replicate studies? So we came up with this very simple idea, which is the idea that we, every time we set up a study, all the study settings are captured in one single configuration file. It's just a JSON file. It's a pairing of keys and values. It's a very trivial idea. And it captures all the active data settings, like surveys and their timings, but also it captures the passive data piece. And now when we do a study, the configuration file that gets generated as part of the setup, we can send that to our colleagues, we can put post on a web page, we can put on a wiki, which we have. And then if somebody wants to replicate our study, they set up their own instance of VEV on AWS, they import that configuration file, they hit go, and you're good to go. And the point is that we can have identical data collection and identical data analysis. And again, why this is needed is because 6% of studies can be completely uh, replicated. There are obvious privacy issues here, uh, and we can talk about them if, if people want. One point that I would make is that it's the two things going on. We hash anything that's potentially identifiable, and then we encrypt everything on, on top of that. And so once, we've, once all is said and done, once we've done the data collection, what does the data look like? Well, we have two stages here. The first is the data processing step. And this is done by the pipeline. So we do imputation, data integrity checks, and so on, and we compute the summary statistics. And the output of the first stage is going to be a matrix where the rows correspond to different summary statistics and the columns correspond to different dates. We typically compute these summaries at the level of, of dates. The second step is in the data, uh, data modeling piece. So this can be a supervised learning. So we might be interested in finding associations between the survey responses and passive data. We might be looking for some clinical outcomes and how they're associated with the data we collect and so on. Or we could be doing completely unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. And one study that, depending on how much time we have, uh, deals with the idea of anomaly detection. So this is a huge problem in, in areas like schizophrenia, but also surgery. So the point is somebody has relapse. We never capture these people early enough. They're, they're hospitalized, and the cost of that is absolutely enormous. So do we need another uh, platform uh, for this type of work? And obviously the answer from my point of view is yes, because we're, we're doing this. But let me try to give you my most important point on this, which is that uh, in biomedical and clinical research, we really need the research grade raw data. So one, one reason is the following. You know, let's say that you use Google step counter or Apple's whatever metric they generate as part of health kit or research kit or something like that. First of all, for Apple and Android, it's going to be completely different things. The second thing is some of these toolboxes are proprietary. The most important problem, I think, is that they keep tweaking these algorithms over time. So now you're in a situation where not only is data going to be comparable across individuals, but with the in-person comparisons over time also become impossible. So this is like trying to understand if people are losing or gaining weight. We all have a different scale. Alex's scale is in pounds, mine is in kilos. And every couple of weeks, some engineer comes and, and adjusts the scale. You know, we would not accept that in, in any, any area of, of research. So I don't think we should accept that here either. Another reason is that when we collect the raw data, we're as close to the hardware as we can. It doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's perfect. 
the data are noisy, but we want to see that. We want to understand the data that's coming out of our, our instruments. The benefit is that we can reanalyze the data years later, perhaps. We can pull the cross studies and so on. And the third point is that we can implement new measures post data collection. So we talk about data banking or biobanking the data. So let's think about one example. So let's say that we decided that we really care about counting the number of steps because we want to learn about someone's physical activity. But let's say that as part of that study, uh, some of the people develop, uh, say, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, even better. And because of that, whenever they're talking on the phone, their hands start shaking. Now, these are not steps. So if we had used proprietary summaries to count the number of steps, we would not be capturing any of this. Now, if we do collect the raw data, we can rewind the tape, we can find the points in time, the intervals, when the person is talking on the phone. Then we go back to the accelerometer data, and we can estimate the frequency and amplitude of these tremors. We couldn't do this if we did not collect the, uh, the raw data. Let me give you maybe just uh, do I have five more minutes. Yeah, please, please. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, you stop. <laughs> So let me tell you a, a, about a couple of ongoing studies that, that we have. I know I only have a couple of minutes, I think. So this is a study that we've been doing, doing at the Brigham. Some of you, I didn't know this until I started this, but neurosurgery was actually invented at the Brigham about 100 years ago. Brigham is, of course, just a few blocks uh, down the road uh, from, from our perspective. So we had a study where we wanted to look at uh, people who have spine, spine tumors. And uh, people use what are called PROMs in this area, and these are patient-reported outcome measures. And they're used both before and after spine surgery. So the goal is to understand how are these patients doing, what's their outcome, and so on. And I should say this is, um, this is a collaboration with several people. Tim Smith is the neurosurgeon uh, who, is, who is working with me at the Brigham. So this is all absolutely joint work between these two groups. And so typically what happens is that these surveys are administered maybe three or four or five times in a one to two year period. So your measurements are really sparse, they're multiple months away from one another. And these are done on using pen and paper. This is a survey that's sent to someone's, someone's home. And a consequence of this is that, and it seems unbelievable to me, but decisions are often made without strong evidence. And so I just discussed this situation with Tim earlier, earlier today that, that when the person comes in, they've had spine surgery or something like that, they, they might be able to look at is the spine fusion this is still working, but it's very hard to assess patient-centered outcomes. Is the, is the person able to walk? Can they climb stairs? Can they sleep? And, and so on. So this is my only uh, clinical picture. This is actually of a person who is in this, in this study. So this is a person, this is their spine, obviously, and uh, this is before surgery. After surgery, they get a spinal fusion. Again, this is where my clinical details, I'm not an MD. So, but you see that they, they fix the spine and it's, so it doesn't move anymore. And, and please tell me, <laughs> I, I don't know the details here, but something like this. Yeah. This is why I need my clinical, clinical collaborators. Uh, so the idea here is the spine has been stabilized. Yeah. And, uh, and, and does this work? And we don't really know. I mean, yes, it can be stabilized, but the, the question is, does it improve this person's mobility, the quality of life, and so on? These questions are essentially unanswered. So in this case, what we did was, we had uh, 105 patients. They have, uh, the disease is located in, 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 with spine disease located in three different locations, and so on. And every day we ask one question and one question only. On a scale from zero to 10, what is your pain level? So zero means you have no pain at all. 10 means you have the worst possible imaginable pain. And of course, we do all kinds of passive data collection throughout. I just want to point you to the, the qualitative nature of our, our findings. So let's look at data for patient A. We collected data for 19 months. On the y-axis here, we have the pain level, zero to 10. 10 is worse, zero is no pain at all. We ask them to do a survey every day. They don't take the survey every day, but they take it almost every other day, which is a lot. <coughs> Traditionally, we would have maybe one data point here and maybe another data point here. So if we were lucky, we would have two data points for this person in this time scale, a before and an after. That's how we would assess how the person is, is doing in terms of pain. Now we have a trajectory. The red line here is the time, is the date when they were operating. 
to come in and, and they have surgery. And what you can see is, if you look at the, the black line, which is a smooth estimate of the actual responses, their pain level is going down over time. And by week 16 or 17, they're almost completely pain free. And if you look at the y axis here, what we did with this GPS data, and every day we try to estimate the probability that this person will move more than one clock. And the idea is what happens here, it's a very successful surgery for this person. Their pain level goes down, and the, the probability that they will move more than one kilometer goes up. And it hits one after eight or nine weeks or something. Similar story for patient B, very high levels of pain, pain goes down, and mobility starts going up, and so on. So it's, this is, we call it, Tim always emphasizes that this is such a simple study, and in a way it is, although the statistical issues are, are, are somewhat challenging here. But the point is, I think the relevant question to ask is how is this an improvement over what we have today? So today, again, we have one point before and one point after. We certainly don't have these types of arcs of, of recovery. So I'll wrap up with, what, do we have one more minute? Sure, the sleep is, I know. Everybody's is falling asleep, so this is yes. perfect, yes. yes. So this is our Harvard undergrad study. Uh, this is work done with Randy Buckner, who is uh, who is a, a professor of neuroscience at the Department of Arts and Sciences at Harvard and, and his group. And this is a study that involved, uh, involved uh, I think, 15 or 16 undergraduate students. We followed them for seven months, and they were fMRI scanned 15 or 16 times, so about every two weeks, which is a ton of uh, scanning if you're, uh, if you're, if you're familiar with, with that work. They also all installed BeeWeek on their smartphone, and they also all wore this Philips Active Watch, which is an FDA-approved device for, for learning about sleep. And so I'm just gonna show you the data. I'm not gonna go into anything too deep. This is data for one randomly chosen subject in the study. So the x-axis here is study time from day one to day 100. The y-axis is 24 o'clock, 6 p.m., midnight, 6 a.m., and so on. Again, this is data for one person over the first 100 days, and you have the black line when they're sleeping. This is data from the watch. The problem is the watch costs $850. Uh, compliance is difficult. It's easy for the undergrad students, but Harvard undergrads, maybe not necessary to say, do not represent the general population, right? You can give them ice cream and you get wonderful data. In so this is how this is this their sleep pattern. Then let's ask the question, well, what if we take VW data and uh, we build a method that enables us to estimate sleep from all the data streams we have. So we combine accelerometer, gene, uh, data, um, screen on of data, and so on. And so just to visualize, to have the simplest possible visualization, this is just a visualization of the screen on of data. So the structure of the plot is the same. The blue dot means that it's, uh, the screen is on. If you don't have a blue dot, the screen is not on. And the intuition is that during the nighttime, the screen should not be on. During the daytime, the screen should be on. The screen might be on at nighttime because maybe they get a text message or maybe they're playing with their phone or something like that. So then you can superimpose these two data sets. And so then you can see what the problem is statistically speaking. You try to estimate two points, the beginning, the, the onset of sleep and offset of sleep. And there should be a lot of stuff going on before sleep starts, a lot of stuff going on after a minimal amount of stuff going on while they are mm -hmm. sleeping. And it turns out that the, the smartphone-based approach captured, and it's difficult uh, to go into details without, the difficult to be specific without going into details, well, they capture something like 96 or 97% of the information uh, using the smartphone compared to what you can get from a wearable. So the sleep, all the events during the sleep time is also correlated with like the sleep quality? So those are the times so, to meet nights. So sleep quality is a very difficult thing to, to get a handle on. Mm -hmm. One can think about things like we know if they're playing with their phone because we can see that from the screen on that spirometer and so on. But it's sleep quality is, is a tricky thing to look at. So um, finally, we can do things like in the schizophrenia cohort, we can try to predict a, a relapse of a patient. So in this case, we know that this patient was hospitalized on this day. And uh, the, the methods are not worth getting into. The idea is, this is a negative log 10 of the p-value. If you have a dot above the dashed line, you have an anomaly in their behavior as measured by passive data. And there's only one anomaly for this person in this entire study, which is the day before they're hospitalized. 
And so when the schizophrenic patient's hospitalized, they spend one to two weeks in a hospital. It seems incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about this specific case. Um, this was worked with a different collaborator. But the idea here is that it might be possible to prevent people from relapsing, whether they are surgical patients, uh, psychiatric patients, and so on. So I'm sorry I went over. I know it's Friday, but thanks so much for sticking with us. So we, we've looked into that, so we didn't, people have done prediction, I get, so there is, um, I talked with your, and yet you might know him, there's actually a guy at Northeastern, he's, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he's done a Steve lot of, Hill? no, this is some, he's done a lot of work with accelerometers. Um, is that Steve from it? Steve? It's just one floor down or up on. What's the name? Steve Hittell. It's, it's not that easy name. It's, it's, uh, I, would, <laughs> I, would, I would remember a name like that. Yeah. This is, anyway, it will come back to me as soon as we're done here. Okay. So, so um, he's pointed to me to some of the work that has been done. And, and when we looked at the literature with my postdoc, Ian, we didn't really find anything in the imputation world. And maybe we didn't look closely enough, but we did do a pretty thorough uh, search. Um, but the goals are a little bit different, because when you're doing imputation, you're doing that obviously to be able to have precise inference. So you're not so much, you don't so much care about specific predictions of locations, you, you care about getting your inference right. But there might be a, there might be a, um, there might be a literature that we, if you know anything, I would love to talk to you more yeah, about I can, that. I, so I've, yeah. had a, um, I've been giving a series of tutorials yeah. on this stuff, so I can send yeah. you the slides on it. What's um, the, so what's the, uh, so there is imputation literature on, on that? Or? Yeah, so the, so the imputation, right, is missing values. And so yeah. if I want to find trajectories, yeah. right, so I saw Tina's GPS here, yeah. and then yeah. I saw it, let's say, in East Boston or yeah. something, I want to know how she got there, yeah. right? And so, and they call it trajectories. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it's just a different kind of wording. Yeah. Now, if the distinction that you're making is that, well, I want to find out the GPS so that I can use it for another inference task, yeah. um, that's usually not what they're doing. They're just saying, yeah, like, I want exactly. to have the best, uh, yes. the, the, the closest to where Tina went. That, that, that's right? a, I think this is the distinction. So, because we don't, so let me go back to, and I, I'm not sure if I said this, and uh, but I, I was going to say here that we don't care here about the specific trajectory so much or the specific location where they are. What we do care about is getting the summary statistics right, and so that the summary statistics will enter a longitudinal model, where let's say the simplest case, we try to regress your, in a longitudinal framework, we try to regress your pain level on your mobility. And we want to understand that relationship. And, and so that's the reason why we do the imputation piece. So when I say we care about the accuracy of inference, that's the part that we're trying to get right. It doesn't, in fact, even if you think about patient data, um, we don't want to know exactly where they are. And, and typically, some IRBs don't even allow you to pull in the, the uh, uh, data. So it's a little bit, I think, different, but I still love to learn everything that they can. And then I have one follow-up question. Yeah. So what's the burden on the iPhone or on the smart device in terms of both storage? And battery. So you mentioned a little bit yeah. about battery, yeah. but uh, yeah. there's a lot more to be said about battery. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So we try to stay at 5% or, or less drain on the battery. And we can customize that because we can customize all the data collection settings. If we're drawing too much power, we will tweak the sampling settings. So we can get that to almost any number you like. At some point, of course, it starts to be less useful. But, uh, but we feel, I mean, I think the idea is that by being able to tweak all these different knobs here, we can really drive the battery consumption to almost anything you, you, you want. On, on the data uh, issue, so in a typical study, we collect about a gigabyte of data per subject per month. And so what happens is we can either use cellular uh, upload or Wi-Fi upload. So we encrypt the data, we store it, uh, we have store and forward architecture, so we store it on the phone. When Wi-Fi becomes available, we dump it to the server, and we delete it from, from the phone. 
So if we had somebody who did not connect to Wi-Fi for a month, they would have a gigabyte of data. Typically, subjects connect to Wi-Fi every two or three days. So then they would uh, have a gigabyte divided by 15, whatever that is. Yeah. So not, 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 not a lot. We had one patient where, where, this, uh, where this went wrong. This person did not connect to Wi-Fi for three or four months. And they were worried how come their, uh, their phone was getting a little slow and so on. But it's highly unusual. We've, we've done this for, I mean, we have all of our studies are small now, but I, it's only one time when we've had somebody who did not connect at least once a month to, uh, to Wi-Fi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. you can go with this, right? I'll probably ask more questions. OK. The question about the future, uh, you say that there's going to be more sensors on the phone. There's also no. going to be probably a battle around privacy yeah. and, and how the iOS already doesn't allow your access to many of your sensors. So yeah. what do you suppose is going to be the, the future progression and how will you deal with that if you have to go up into a company level to actually think about that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the main thing that we don't get um, the main thing we don't get from uh, the iPhone is the communication box. And everything else we can get from essentially essentially the same. And there are some small changes. I don't think we get the proximity from Android and so on. But all the, all the data streams that we really care about, we can get from both devices. The only exception is that we can get communication logs only from Android phones. 85% of the world uses Android. So from that point of view, it's, it's fine. But it turns out that there's a big correlation between SES, socioeconomic status. So people who make more money typically have iPhones. So uh, and actually, the, so that, that's one, one thing to uh, take into consideration. So, so far, um, we have one data stream that we cannot capture that we would like. Apple has an interface um, that they could potentially give us access to. I forget what it's, what it's called. You don't still get quite as much as you get from an Android, but you have to go pretty high up. But a couple of my collaborators are, I'm nowhere near there, but a couple of my collaborators are high enough that, that uh, they might be able to uh, make the call and say, well, we, we need that. But in the bigger picture, I actually think that the data collection that we already have, I mean, it would be wonderful and lovely to have more and more sensors, but I think the main intellectual challenge is now becoming data analysis. So if we think about a standard longitudinal study, you have two or three or four waves of data. We have 300 or 400 waves of data. So these methods were not developed for, for, for something like that. So, so, and that's where, and of course I'm biased because that's what we do, we try to develop these methods, but I think that that's where the difficulty lies. So, so, uh, so I think the future is, uh, is uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about it because even with the data we can collect today, I mean, there's so much here for, for us to do. So how, I'm just curious, how much longer do you think we'll wait until you go to the doctor and says, please download this app, because, and then a month from now I'm going to email the diagnosis? That's a great question. I don't know. Doctors are generally, uh, uh, with perhaps the present company uh, uh, exempted, some, uh, let, me put it, let me say it this way, psychiatrists are a group of doctors who are wary sometimes of technology. But a lot of other doctors that I work with, they're much more comfortable, and you know, the people I work with, they embrace technology. So, so I don't know if it's so a bias selection. It's bias, yes. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> sure. So, and I think you want to distinguish between screening and uh, and diagnosis yes, as well. Yeah. For screening, uh, so for example, we have a bipolar study at MGH, and we have bipolar patients and depression subjects, and we see that there are behavioral patterns for the bipolar subjects that jump up and down pretty considerably. For the MDD patients, they're generally low and they, they vary less. So if you had a large enough study, it might be possible to, I mean, I would love to see every patient instrumented in, in this way. Um, UCLA has a study in the planning that would have more than 100,000 subjects in it. I don't know if they will be using BE, but uh, it's, it's been discussed. Also at McLean, you have typically hundreds of people who are waiting before they get into treatment. Yeah. So, so you know, if this takes three, four, or five months before they're treated for a month or, yeah. or two months, depending on what the treatment is, 
it would be wonderful to put these people to instrument them and see what their behavior is like before treatment starts. So now you're looking at the pre and, and post. So. But what, what if I sign up with my doctor's office and says, yeah. please download this in yeah. case something comes up, I can yeah. just look at your data. Yeah and see whether there's a chance that you yeah. have that, right? Yeah. Otherwise, I'm yeah. not touching your data, yeah. but it's just kind of like, I can look into the I would, I would love it. I mean, if, if I would have, you know, if I would have my way, everybody would, would, uh, would this have this on, the, on their phone. Yes, but you're biased once again. I will be biased. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. We all have our own biases. Yes. I, I admit to that. Yes. All right, well, thank you, JP. Well, thank this you so much. <laughs>